Russia, the land where empires die. The sheer size of this vast wild land has rung the death knell of empires from Napoleon to Hitler. The biggest nation on earth, Russia stretches from Europe to the Pacific. Ruled for centuries by the Tsar, Russia had become a Christian land. But the flame of Christianity became an ember under the traditions of man's religion. Through wars and strife, the Tsars struggled to hold on to this crumbling empire. Russia became a police state with a state religion that had grown cold and now persecuted the fire of revival that had begun to spread among the people. Russia's most conspicuous failure is the man who should be its strength, Tsar Nicholas II, a moody, henpecked husband at home, a vacillating autocrat to his subjects. In the chaos of the First World War, Russia was in turmoil, and its people suffered the hardships of war and famine. Russia had a bloodless revolution that granted political freedoms to the people and promise for the future. But the Bolsheviks hijacked this revolution, killed the Tsar and his family, and plunged Russia into 70 years of misery and death under communism. This set the stage for our heroes, who are about to show up with the revival fires, fresh from the Azusa Street Revival in America. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm so excited that you're with us today. Today, we're gonna to take you on a journey. We're gonna uncover a revival that you probably have never heard about. It's an amazing story that you're not gonna to wanna to miss. Stay with me because you're gonna hear just how incredible God has been when it comes to His people, His missionaries, and His Word, how He remains true. Genesis 26, 18 tells us Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Today I want to introduce to you first, Doug Bonner. Doug, thanks for joining me today. Pleased to be here. So tell me, what have you got for me? Well, I've got a great story here of a, a young man. He was born in, in, in Siberia. He was a Cossack. But the wonderful thing about this, he was born with one name, but he lived the rest of his life with another name and identity. How did he do that? It's a great story. He was, uh, he was attending a small Baptist uh, church where he met his wife, but a friend of him introduced him and got him a job as a Cossack for the Tsar in the military, really. And he was fine there until something happened. It was the 19th of August, 1907. And in that Baptist church, he gave his life to Christ. He was, he was, he was born again. A great change happened in him, but in his conscience, in his heart, he, uh, he was a soldier at the time but he decided on his own that the only weapon that he would carry in future would be the sword of the Spirit, the okay. Word of God. Wait a minute, you're telling me this guy <clears throat> gets saved in a Baptist church, but he's also one of the Tsar soldiers. He certainly is. So tell me, what happened next? How does this fit together? It can't be a very good thing. Well, uh, he told his superiors, he, he was basically uh, saying to them, I will not fight for you, I'll only fight for God. So he was court-martialed, and he was heading towards that. And Wait, how, how did the court-martial happen? Well, um, he basically, it was a year after that um, he was brought before the tribunal and all that, all that went through, but his life was in, in, in peril in that time because the end of a court-martial, especially in those days, is not good. But God had a plan for him. What, so <clears throat> he's 
one of the czar soldiers, he got, why did he get court-martialed? Because he was a believer? Was he, is that the reason why? No, basically he told him, I will not carry a gun. Well, he's a soldier, he's supposed to carry oh. a gun. And he just, he decided he was gonna carry the sword of the spirit. That was the only weapon he would have in his hand. So he, he's court-martialed, what happened after that? Well, uh, he was in trouble. And yeah. he was not afraid to do that. I mean, that was some, some seeds of an, an, a trait that would follow on throughout his whole life. He took some big decisions. Well, he was in, in uh, trouble at that time. And um, a friend of his came to him. And, and now his name was not Ivan. It became Ivan. He was born Nikita. But uh, a friend of... Uh, so this, this is a picture of him? Yeah, right that's here. a great picture of, um, of him in, in those days. So uh, Nikita was uh, uh, approached by a, a brother in the Tashkent uh, church. And he was also still a, a, a soldier. He ended up in the 5th uh, Cossack regiment of, of that day. And, and this brother, um, he came to him and he said, look, you're going um, to die if you stay here. But he had no passport. How could he escape? Well, this brother said, I have a passport, and the Lord has spoken and, and, uh, to me to give you a new identity. So that's when he took his, his new name, and it was no longer Nikita, but Ivan Vernayov. So Ivan Vernayov now, now what, did he take this guy's name or he just made him a passport and was... No, he had it. He swapped, well, um, I don't know if he swapped his identity, but oh, all okay. of a sudden that piece of paper, and of course there was no photographs in those days. Is it? Right. So it, it was just the form right. itself. But he had to take that name. And the interesting thing was he kept that for the rest of his days. So he kept... He kept the name. That's interesting. All right, so where'd he go? He's got this passport. Where'd he go? Well, it took him a while. He had an adventure through, through, at, at, uh, uh, through China. In fact, one of his, his children was born there, but he ended up as a Russian um, immigrant on the west coast of a, a, a America. Okay, wait a minute. So he, he gets on a boat like this, the Mauritania. A, a, a steamboat, exactly right. And, and he comes over to America, and you said west coast specifically California. Yes. Then we're in the 1900s. That means he's right there during the Azusa Street Revival. And that's so interesting because he writes about that. He began actually in San Francisco, but he wasn't there that long. Now he was a Baptist, so he was assigned a, a, a he was a pastor. Um, so I, what, what did he think? I mean, here's this Russian Baptist <laughs> under another name comes to America and he winds up at Azusa Street. <laughs> that had to be a little, uh, uh, quite a shock. Uh, uh, um, absolutely. It was, it was interesting. It was the first time he'd heard of Pentecost in, in those days. It was a little after the initial outpouring there, but the embers were still there. And of course, that was all the discussion in those days. Now, he was pretty much um, then assigned as a missionary to Seattle. And he had just bore great fruit there. And he ended up with a congregation of about 70 or 80 Russian um, immigrants. Uh, right. I mean, that was his mission field of, of that day. But God had gone ahead before him, and uh, he, had, he had a problem because of the growth of that church. He needed space. So he, he approached a, uh, a brother there, and uh, he became uh, good friends with a gentleman called Ernest S. Williams. Now, Ernest S. Uh, Williams was a, a, a pioneer and a, a founder, a future general superintendent of the Assemblies of oh, God. Wow. He can't escape yeah. it, can he, really? No. Now, his family have said that uh, he had many evenings of very spirited discussions. You must uh, remember, we have a conservative Baptist. Uh, Baptist. Yeah. We have a Pentecostal here. And, and, but it was a, a great time. He had a hunger for the things of God. But he was on a, a, a Simon a, a, a second time. He was sent to the Big Apple now to the East Coast. Oh, wow. So from the West to the East, and he was assigned a work there. And he went from a church of about 80 to about 18, but he's still Baptist at that time. But something is about to change. So what happened? I mean, he's there. 
What changed? What well, um, again, God had gone before him. These Pentecostals keep uh, popping up all his life. So he's in a, in a, a high rise in an apartment in uh, the city of New York. And unbeknown to him, his neighbors are Pentecostals. Nah. But more than that, <laughs> he's a marked man. He's a marked man. He cannot yeah. escape. But more than that, they attend the church of that day. It was called Glad Tidings Tabernacle. Oh, wow. Marie Brown had, had founded that, and it was almost like Azusa on the East Coast. A great, a, 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 uh, a great work happened there, but flowed out of there. Right. Azusa had moved almost from the West Coast to, to the, the East Coast. Correct. So as he's there, does he meet anybody? What you said he's about to lose. He's about to happen something with his. Baptist yeah, faith. yeah. Well, it's interesting. It wasn't uh, a minister that changed his life. It was his daughter. It was in the children. So there. is that this? Is this her? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, she was nine years old and just beautiful. And her neighbor was um, had um, asked her to attend her church because the church that they were attending was Baptist. But the church, her neighbor, I think her name was Annie, and uh, a 14-year-old, a, and, uh, a, a so Vera, uh, she goes along to a first Pentecostal uh, uh, service. An altar call uh, was given at that time, and, and, and precious Vera, only nine, a child, she goes forward, she's baptized in the Holy Spirit, but she speaks in other tongues. And, uh, that changed her life, but it had a greater impact on her father's life. She goes home and she says, um, Papa, something happened to me at church. And she tells the story. And I like to picture Marie Brown being there. She was the great pioneer there. And just laying hands on her and her being baptized in the Holy Spirit. She says, Papa, something happened. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And her father, even though he's a, he's, he's a staid man, he's, a, he, 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 he's, he's Russian, he, he said, I need that. Please pray for me to receive that experience. So through the ministry of a small child, this man and his ministry that would affect a whole continent was changed. And Ivan Vernell was baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, that's... Uh... Everything we talk about here is how you can be the one. Yes. You can be the one to bring revival. And I think it's really interesting. You know, this guy has been through so much. And here he is in America, in a foreign land, and he's crisscrossed this nation. And he keeps, but it's a, the little child, a nine-year-old girl, that brings him to, in to understand what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Yeah. There really is no age limit None. on how you can be the one. None. So Doug, how did he go from being filled in the spirit or with the spirit here in America and he's going back to Russia? How did that happen? It was a word of the Lord from the wife of a co-worker who said, Verneyev, you must go to Russia. So he actually had a word from the Lord. She actually had a word for him. Yes, he did, but he struggled, I think with that. It was almost like, you know, here, here am I, Lord, send someone else. Mm. So, but he, um, he really, he discounted that, but he'd already heard it. So uh, about three weeks um, um, after that, him and a, a friend of his, they went out uh, into the countryside, into the um, forest uh, to pray. And because he, he's struggling with still this whole yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, just think about the circumstances. Oh, yeah, I, I can only, I can't fathom what he must have been thinking. Like, that's the last place I want to go is right back into Russia. Because of the war. Things uh, are worse now. Absolutely. They're a whole lot harder. Especially if you're a Christian. Yes, yes. The communists were in charge now, and it was not good for, for, for a believer there. But he goes to pray, and he just opens his heart, and he says, Now, you must re um, remember his family has said, You're not going alone. Right. We're coming along. So he said, wife and children are going, going with him. And not only that, there was a number of other families and their children. So oh it was my. a whole host of families, but I think three or four of them. So that was a heavy thing on him. So he's looking for a sign. He what is, happened? that's right. And, and that's where he was. So he, he's in the forest. He says, uh, and the Lord speaks to him, but the Lord says, your provision will be in the land of your birth. You must go. Ah. 
And just on the inside, he hears the Holy he Spirit knew. say, look up under that bush. So he goes to that bush. There's a full basket of produce there. And the Lord again says, I will provide for you over there, not in here. In the land of your birth. In the land of your the birth. The provision is in the land of your birth. It absolutely is. Wow, so he had his word from God. Yes. And he went. Yes, he did. So he's going to go back to Russia, but things in Russia had not gotten better. Oh, my word. You must remember, it was about... It was I mean, a, Doug, I was there in 91, right when the wall came yes, down. Yes, And I was still Just, amazed the actual fear that was still rampant in, the, in all of Russia. And you must uh, remember the timeline here. It was a year after the close of the hostilities in mm. World War I. Right. But the hostilities were just beginning in his homeland. The Bolsheviks at that day had just, you know, started to, uh, to, you know, to throw their their weight around. So he was he, he was seeing this. All these thousands of refugees were fleeing, and he had a word from the Lord that he was to go there. And Ivan and his group of friends are going in. So he's there, you know, and and I'm I'm just trying to put myself in this man's position. He's, yeah. He knows he's got a word from God. Yes. He's been obviously affected by what he experiences in America, but he's yes. going back to the Soviet Union when it's worse than it's ever been Yes. for a Christian to be there. And so he arrives and he's, he sees what's happening. What does he, how do they, how do they receive him? How does he even get in the country? Well, that's the amazing thing that just, um, the, the KGB, and it's all in the files that we have here, they knew he was coming. He didn't smuggle himself in. He applied for a visa. And the amazing thing was they let him in. Wow. And not only that, it, now they were watching him, but, but their mindset was so interesting. It was wrong, but it was good for Ivan. Sure. And it was this, while um, and, and they were dismantling the Russian Orthodox uh, church at that time, and so they were, uh, they were, they were very happy for any competition that might be against them. So communism is really coming into its own at it this is, point. It is big time, big and time. So they're they're seeing him as like, oh, he'll just cause trouble. Yeah, for yeah. the Orthodox Church. Ah, yeah, okay. It's like the small flame just came into that country, right. and they thought that won't hurt anybody. So he arrives, and you might think, well, I'm okay. I've got my visa, but it's not so easy. Right. It, it's in winter time. They take his money, his Bibles, even his his overcoats, off him, and they uh, and their thinking is, what can a small Christian family who have no food and no clothing and no finances do to hurt anybody? Right. Um, it changes. I the think whole we all country. would ask that question. Um, exactly. Who am I? I don't have anything. Right. And so, what did he do? Uh, it's it's uh, it's winter. It's not summer. Well, he just jumps in. He, he preaches the, the, the gospel. He prays for the sick. He, he carries out uh, the commission to go and win the lost. And a, a miracle happens. Now, um, he started off with nothing. And in one year, he had a church of 400. It was not, and it was Pentecostal. Unheard hey, so, of. Okay, I'm, I'm still stuck back on... All your Bibles are gone and your overcoat's gone and all this. <laughs> oh, my word. I mean, what was he thinking when he walked out? I have no way to stay warm in the middle oh, of winter. Oh, my word. I mean, I would have thought of, you know, poor old me. And, sure. But he said. I would have been like, uh, can I go back? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after all, I heard from the Lord. I had a prophecy. Right. All these finances. Surely it's going to be just a red carpet. And it was not. But um, we're now in, I think, uh, the 20th year into the new century. And uh, he just jumps in to uh, uh, the seven most fruitful years of mm. his personal, uh, his ministry there. Now, the Soviets, they knew he was there. The KGB had the information and they are aware that he's now got a church of 400 and it's in all their newspapers, in the KGB periodicals mm. and stuff. But he starts to uh, minister and, and the apostle in him, the evangelist in him just comes out. Within a seven year period, an amazing transition just took place. Right. He's, um, he founded over 350 uh, churches. 
And it's estimated that there were 17,000 who were in attendance in, in those churches during that period, just 1,000 in his own church. Wow, which was in the middle of all of that um, persecution. And turmoil. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he was beaten up. He was allowed in, but it was on, our, it was on their, their terms. terms. So they intimidated him, they threatened him, they beat him up, but they were distracted with, and I'm sure that all the people who were praying for him over in the U.S. were, um, were, were, were um, influencing the distraction of those years because right. the KGB were focused in the old God, the old church, in shutting, shutting it down. But as that was coming down, this great work was ascending up. But the fist, the iron fist of, of, um, of communism was only restrained for a short time. And in, in, I think it was 1920s. Uh, so he's having a major revival going on yes. within the Hammer Falls. Absolutely. And it comes in really hard and really quick. And, and the family, they were able to escape. Um, his, his wife was in prison for 25 years. They thought she died. A, a, How did, why did she go to prison? What happened? Well, because he went and she carried on that work. Uh, but they soon got her, they, uh, a, a, I mean, they arrested her, and so she was in prison for 25 years. They thought she died, but she smuggled a, a letter out, a very touching word to her children, and she said that my prayer is this, I only have a short time on this earth, I want to spend a few years with my family. And she wow. did, her, her last five years. Now her husband, he pays the ultimate price. He, he now, he wears that martyr's uh, crown. He was moved to a place called the Peter Paul Fortress, which was a place where you went in, but you didn't come out alive. And he, he was killed there in 1937. The thinking that we found in the KGB uh, records that we have here was that if we remove the head, the body, right will die, but they were greatly mistaken. So the KGB is trying to get rid of the si situation. Yeah, yeah. In fact, even in their own... Uh, it didn't work. No, in their files, they said it was like an inferno they could not control. I thought that's... Act Wait a minute, say that again. They it said was it like an inferno, Acts chapter 2. An inferno they can't control. The baptism wow. in the Holy Spirit and fire. Praise so, God. but I mean, I mean, these, I mean, these poor guys were moved from camp to um, to camp, and uh, and the and the fires spread. The, Doug, this is history we've never. It heard. absolutely not. Absolutely, I mean, I'd never heard of this until we uh, just found these files and did this research. But then, uh, you know, the years went on, and and Stalin he died, mm. and, and and Khrushchev. He took over. And what well, happened? What happened? With, this must have been huge. Absolutely huge. The, I mean, just imagine this. The, all the prisons were full. I mean, uh, um, um, Stalin imprisoned everybody, and Christoph thought, I've got to empty those out. So 90% of, of all those were just released. But unbeknown to him, these firebrands, those 800 pastors, and all the thousands and thousands of believers who had been part of that second great awakening and revival, now they're released. They're sent forth. And this is the greatest work of all. This that began at Azusa, that, that then it moved on to a nine-year-old who got her daddy baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's dead. He's in heaven. He has his crown, but his legacy is still happening. And it's estimated not our estimations, this is the, mm. the, the, uh, the KGB say that 1,300,000 were born again as a result wow. of that. So what happened after that when this great revival in the 50s started happening? What, the family moves on and it ends up where? Um, in America, I think in the, um, on the East Coast and, uh, and their relatives are still here today and, and, and they're alive. And, um, but we kind of fast forward now because this revival is still happening and a gentleman that we all have heard of called Brother Andrew, mm. he intersected with that revival in the 70s. He smuggled thousands and thousands of Bibles into that country and that was like um, um, a breeze on these embers 
and now all these believers that didn't have anything but a, 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 a um, an experience of being born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, they had the Holy Scriptures. And that work is still thriving in Russia um, today. Wow. We went all the way. And as they ended, what happened to Katerina? Is she fine? Did she ever get out? Yeah, yeah. They thought she was dead, obviously. But um, they released her. <clears throat> and there were people here, the Assemblies of God, were, uh, were campaigning to get them all out. And, they were, and, and for a short time, that iron curtain that was so immovable, it was raised for just that moment. And she was able to come out and spend the last few years. It was the cry of her, of her heart to spend the last few years with her children. That's wonderful. What a phenomenal story. Thanks, Doug, for everything. You know, guys, there's more information. We know about Berenayev. We know about the William Seymour, but we just found out there's more to the story about East Coast. Not yeah. the West Coast. Not the West Coast. East Coast. On the yeah. East Coast. Yeah, because um, I remember, you know, that we did that great interview um, about Ivan Berenayev, but he actually... Um, he had a church on the West Coast. He moved over to the, <coughs> the East Coast, but he ended up with planting 350 churches wow. in Ukraine, in Belgium, and uh, I mean, just an explosion that's still reverberating here today. Well, this show has focused on the revival, um, all the revivals that happened through 1987. And of course, we had Rick Renner that came and filled us mm -hmm. into current day. But I mean, still, we hear about this church that impacted Voronayev, you know, Maria, Burgess? That's right. She was just, I mean, was it uh, 19 years old? She had a vision of Jesus and he said, will you forsake all and, and follow me? So she was trained at the, the Moody Bible Institute, uh, but she got hungry and she began to pray and to fast and she got the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Which she wow. was 26 years old when, when she got that. And so, you know, within a few months, she felt this urgency to minister to people at New, in New York City. Yeah, and God brought along her, um, her husband. He was called Robert A. Brown. So mm -hmm. her name is now Marie Brown. And, and of course, we're talking about a tremendous move. It was called Glad uh, Tidings Hall or, or Tabernacle in New York uh, and, uh, City. It was like, Azusa on the east. So he, he came to this Glad Tidings Temple? Yes. Well, they actually remember the neighbor did, and the oh. neighbor talked to his daughter, and it went from there. But, I mean, the very first meeting that this Glad Tidings had, <coughs> two drunks walked in, and God supernaturally delivered them of alcoholism, and they walked Amazing. out dry. The book of Acts is still being written, isn't it? It, it sure is. is. The it's survival. So there you are. Revival on every coast possible. West coast, east coast, wherever you're at. Just remember, guys, it's all about being the one, no matter what your situation, no matter what your place is in life, take the opportunity to reach out like Vera and I have did and be the one.